essay one of three essays by james freeman clark this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales three essays by james freeman clark essay one have animals souls to answer this question we must first inquire what we mean by a soul if we mean a human soul it is certain that animals do not possess it at least not in a fully developed condition if we mean do they possess an immortal soul that is perhaps a question difficult to answer either in the affirmative or the negative but if we mean by the soul an immaterial principle of life which coordinates the body organization to a unity which is the ground of growth activity perception volition which is intelligent affectionate and to a certain extent free then we must admit that animals have souls the same arguments which induce us to believe that there is a soul in man apply to animals the world has generally believed that in man beside the body there is also soul why have people believed it the reason probably is that beside all that can be accounted for as the result of the juxtaposition of material particles there remains a very important element unaccounted for mechanical and physical agency may explain much but the most essential characteristic of vital phenomena they do not explain they do not account for the unity in variety permanence in change growth from within by continuous processes coming from the vital functions in an organized body every such body has a unity peculiar to itself which cannot be considered the result of the collocation of material molecules it is a unity which controls these molecules arranges and rearranges them maintains a steady activity carries the body through the phenomena of growth and causes the various organs to cooperate for the purposes of the whole the vital power is not merely the result of material phenomena but it reacts on these as a cause add to this that strange phenomenon of human consciousness the sense of personality which is the clear perception of selfhood as a distinct unchanging unit residing in a body all of whose parts are in perpetual flux and we see why the opinion of a soul has arisen it has been assumed by the common sense of mankind that in every living body the cause of the mode of existence of each part is contained in the whole as soon as death intervenes each part is left free to pass through changes peculiar to itself alone life is a power which acts from the whole upon the parts causing them to resist chemical laws which begin to act as soon as life departs the unity of a living body does not result from an ingenious juxtaposition of parts like that of a watch for example for the unity of a living body implies that which is called the vital vortex or perpetual exchange of particles a watch or clock is the nearest approach which has been made by man to the creation of a living being a watch for instance contains the principle of its action in itself and is not moved from without in that it resembles a living creature we can easily conceive of a watch which might be made to go seventy years without being wound up it might need to be oiled occasionally but not as often as an animal needs to be fed a watch is also like a living creature in having a unity as a whole not belonging to the separate parts and to which all parts conspire namely that of marking the progress of time why then say that a man has a soul and that a watch has not the difference is this the higher principle of unity in the watch that is its power of marking time is wholly an effect and never a cause it is purely and only the result of the arrangement of wheels and springs in other words of material conditions 
but in man the principle of unity is also a cause life reacts upon body the laws of matter are modified by the power of life chemical action is suspended living muscles are able to endure without laceration the application of forces which would destroy the dead fibre so the thought the love the will of a living creature react on the physical frame a sight a sound a few spoken words a message seen in a letter cause an immense revulsion in the physical condition something is suddenly told us and we faint away or even die from the effect of the message here mind acts upon matter showing that in man mind is not merely a result but also a cause hence men have generally believed in the existence of a soul in man they have not been taught it by metaphysicians it is one of the spontaneous inductions of common sense from universal experience but this argument applies equally to prove a soul in animals the same reaction of soul on body is constantly apparent every time that you whistle to your dog and he comes bounding toward you his mind has acted on his body his will has obeyed his thought his muscles have obeyed his will the cause of his motion was mental not physical this is too evident to require any further illustration therefore regarding the soul as a principle of life connected with the body but not its result or in other words as an immaterial principle of activity there is the same reason for believing in the soul of animals that there is for believing in the soul of man but when we ask as to the nature of the animal soul and how far it is analogous to that of man we meet with certain difficulties let us see then how many of the human qualities of the soul are to be found in animals and so discover if there is any remainder not possessed by them peculiar to ourselves that the vital soul or principle of life belongs equally to plants animals and men is evident this is so apparent as to be granted even by descartes who regards animals as mere machines or automata destitute of a thinking soul but not of life or feeling they are automata but living and feeling automata descartes denies them a soul because he defines the soul as the thinking and knowing power but locke with whom leibniz fully agreed on this point ascribes to animals thought as well as feeling and makes their difference from man to consist in their not possessing abstract ideas we shall presently see the truth of this most sagacious remark plants animals and men are alike in possessing the vital principle which produces growth which causes them to pass through regular phases of development which enables them to digest and assimilate food taken from without and which carries on a steady circulation within to this are added in the animal the function of voluntary locomotion perception through the senses of an outward world the power of feeling pleasure and pain some wonderful instincts and some degree of reflective thought animals also possess memory imagination playfulness industry the sense of shame and many other very human qualities take for example buffon's fine description of the dog histoire du chien by nature fiery irritable ferocious and sanguinary the dog in his savage state is a terror to other animals but domesticated he becomes gentle attached and desirous to please he hastens to lay at the feet of his master his courage his strength and all his abilities he listens for his master's orders inquires his will consults his opinion begs his permission understands the indications of his wishes without possessing the power of human thought he has all the warmth of human sentiment he has more than human fidelity he is constant in his attachments he is made up of zeal ardour and obedience he remembers kindness longer than wrong 
he endures bad treatment and forgets it disarming it by patience and submission no one who has ever had a dog for a friend will think this description exaggerated if any should so consider it we will cite for their benefit what mr jesse one of the latest students of the canine race asserts concerning it in his researches into the history of the british dog london eighteen sixty six he says that remarkable instances of the following virtues feelings and powers of mind are well authenticated the dog risks his life to give help goes for assistance saves life from drowning fire other animals and men assists distress guards property knows boundaries resents injuries repays benefits communicates ideas combines with other dogs for several purposes understands language knows when he is about to die knows death in a human being devotes his whole life to the object of his love dies of grief and of joy dies in his master's defence commits suicide remains by the dead solicits and gives alarm knows the characters of men recognises a portrait and men after long absence is fond of praise and sensible to ridicule feels shame and is sensible of a fault is playful is incorruptible finds his way back from distant countries is magnanimous to smaller animals is jealous has dreams and takes a last farewell when dying much of this it may be said is instinctive we must therefore distinguish between instinct and intelligence or rather between instinctive intelligence and reflective intelligence many writers on the subject of animals have not carefully distinguished these very different activities of the soul even m leroy one of the first in modern times who brought careful observation to the study of the nature of animals has not always kept in view this distinction as has been noticed by a subsequent french writer of very considerable ability m floriens the following marks according to m florens distinguish instinct from intelligence instinct is spontaneous intelligence is deliberate instinct is necessary intelligence is conditional instinct is invariable intelligence is modifiable instinct is innate intelligence comes from observation and experience instinct is fatal intelligence is free instinct is particular intelligence is general thus the building faculty of the beaver is an instinct for it acts spontaneously and always in the same way it is not a general faculty of building in all places and ways but a special power of building houses of sticks mud and other materials with the entrance under water and a dry place within when beavers build on a running stream they begin by making a dam across it which preserves them from losing the water in a drought but this also is a spontaneous and invariable act the old stories of their driving piles using their tails for trowels and having well-planned houses with many chambers have been found to be fictitious that the beaver builds by instinct though intelligence comes in to modify the instinct appears from his wishing to build his house or his dam when it is not needed mr broderip the english naturalist had a pet beaver that manifested his building instinct by dragging together warming pans sweeping brushes boots and sticks which he would lay crosswise he then would fill in his wall with clothes bits of coal turf laying it very even finally he made a nest for himself behind his wall with clothes hay and cotton as this creature had been brought from america very young all this procedure must have been instinctive but his intelligence showed itself in his adapting his mode of building to his new circumstances 
his instinct led him to build his wall and to lay his sticks crosswise and to fill in with what he could find according to the universal and spontaneous procedure of all beavers but his making use of a chest of drawers for one side of his wall and making brushes and boots instead of cutting down trees were no doubt acts of intelligence a large part of the wonderful procedure of bees is purely instinctive bees from the beginning of the world and in all countries of the earth have lived in similar communities have had their queen to lay eggs for them if their queen is lost have developed a new one in the same way by altering the conditions of existence in one of their larvae have constructed their hexagonal cells by the same mathematical law so as to secure the most strength from the least outlay of material all this is instinct for it is spontaneous and not deliberate it is universal and constant but when the bee deflects his comb in order to avoid a stick thrust across the inside of the hive and begins the variation before he reaches the stick this can only be regarded as an act of intelligence animals then have both instincts and intelligence and so has man a large part of human life proceeds from tendencies as purely if not as vigorously instinctive as those of animals man has social instincts which create human society children play from an instinct the maternal instinct in a human mother is till modified by reflection as spontaneous universal and necessary as the same instinct in animals but in man the instincts are reduced to a minimum and are soon modified by observation experience and reflection in animals they are at their maximum and are modified in a much less degree it is sometimes said that animals do not reason but man does but animals are quite capable of at least two modes of reasoning that of comparison and that of inference they compare two modes of actions or two substances and judge the one to be preferable to the other and accordingly select it sir emerson tennant tells us that elephants employed to build stone walls in ceylon will lay each stone in its place then stand off and look to see if it is plumb and if not will move it with their trunk till it lies perfectly straight this is a pure act of reflective judgment he narrates an adventure which befell himself in ceylon while riding on a narrow road through the forest he heard a rumbling sound approaching and directly there came to meet him an elephant bearing on his tusks a large log of wood which he had been directed to carry to the place where it was needed sir emerson tennant's horse unused to these monsters was alarmed and refused to go forward the sagacious elephant perceiving this evidently decided that he must himself go out of the way but to do this he was obliged first to take the log from his tusks with his trunk and lay it on the ground which he did and then backed out of the road between the trees till only his head was visible but the horse was still too timid to go by whereupon the judicious pachyderm pushed himself farther back till all of his body except the end of his trunk had disappeared then sir emerson succeeded in getting his horse by but stopped to witness the result the elephant came out took the log up again laid it across his tusks and went on his way this story told by an unimpeachable witness shows several successive acts of reasoning the log-bearer inferred from the horse's terror that it would not pass he again inferred that in that case he must himself get out of the way that to do this he must lay down his log that he must go farther back and accompanying this was his sense of duty making him faithful to his task and most of all his consideration of what was due to his human traveller which kept him from driving the horse and man before him as he went on there is another well-authenticated anecdote of an elephant 
he was following an ammunition wagon and saw the man who was seated on it fall off just before the wheel the man would have been crushed had not the animal instantly run forward and without an order lifted the wheel with his trunk and held it suspended in the air till the wagon had passed over the man without hurting him here were combined presence of mind good will knowledge of the danger to the man and a rapid calculation of how he could be saved perhaps i may properly introduce here an account of the manifestations of mind in the animals i have had the most opportunity of observing i have a horse who was named rubazal after the mountain spirit of the hearts made famous in the stories of musias we have contracted his name to ruby for convenience now i have reason to believe that ruby can distinguish sunday from other days on sunday i have been in the habit of driving to boston to church but on other days i drive to the neighbouring village where are the post office shops of mechanics and other stores to go to boston i usually turn to the right when i leave my driveway to go to the village i turn to the left now on sunday if i leave the reins loose so that the horse may do as he pleases he invariably turns to the right and goes to boston on other days he as invariably turns to the left and goes to the village he does this so constantly and regularly that none of the family have any doubt of the fact that he knows that it is sunday how he knows it we are unable to discover i have left my house at the same hour on sunday and on monday in the same carriage with the same number of persons in it and yet on sunday he always turns to the right and on monday to the left he is fed at the same time on sunday as on other days but the man comes back to harness him a little later on sunday than at other times and that is possibly his method of knowing that it is the day for going to boston but see how much of observation memory and thought is implied in all this again ruby has shown a very distinct feeling of the supernatural driving one day up a hill near my house we met a horse-car coming down toward us running without horses simply by the force of gravity my horse became so frightened that he ran into the gutter and nearly overturned me and i got him past with the greatest difficulty now he had met the cars coming down that hill drawn by horses a hundred times and had never been alarmed moreover only a day or two after in going up the same hill we saw a car moving uphill before us where the horses were entirely invisible being concealed by the car itself which was between us and the horses but this did not frighten ruby at all he evidently said to himself the horses are there though i do not see them but in the other case it seemed to him an effect without a cause something plainly supernatural there was nothing in the aspect of the car itself to alarm him he had seen that often enough he was simply terrified by seeing it move without any adequate cause just as we might be if we saw our chairs begin to walk about the room our newfoundland dog's name is donatello which again is shortened to don in common parlance he has all the affectionate and excellent qualities of his race he is the most good-natured creature i ever saw nothing provokes him little dogs may yelp at him the cat or kittens may snarl and spit at him he pays no attention to them a little dog climbs on his back and lies down there one of the cats will lie between his legs but at night when he is on guard no one can approach the house unchallenged but his affection for the family is very great to be allowed to come into the house and lie down near us is his chief happiness he was very fond of my son e who played with him a good deal and when the young man went away during the war with a three months regiment don was much depressed by his absence he walked down regularly to the station and stood there till a train of cars came in 
and when his friend did not arrive in it he went back with a melancholy air to the house but at last the young man returned it was in the evening and dawn was lying on the piazza as soon as he saw his friend his exultation knew no bounds he leaped upon him and ran round him barking and showing the wildest signs of delight all at once he turned and ran into the garden and came back bringing an apple which he laid down at the feet of his young master it was the only thing he could think of to do for him and this sign of his affection was quite pathetic the reason why don thought of the apple was probably this we had taught him to go and get an apple for the horse when so directed we would say go don get an apple for poor ruby then he would run up into the garden and bring an apple and hold it up to the horse and perhaps when the horse tried to take it he would pull it away after doing this a few times he would finally lie down on his back under the horse's nose and allow the latter to take the apple from his mouth he would also kiss the horse on being told to do so when we said don kiss poor ruby he leaped up and kissed the horse's nose but he afterwards hit upon a more convenient method of doing it he got his paw over the rein and pulled down the horse's head so that he could continue the osculatory process more at his ease sitting comfortably on the ground animals know when they have done wrong so far at least as that means disobeying our will or command the only great fault which don ever committed was stealing a piece of meat from our neighbour's kitchen i do not think he was punished or even scolded for it for we did not find it out till later when it would have done no good to punish him but a week or two after that the gentleman whose kitchen had been robbed was standing on my lawn talking with me and he referred laughingly to what don had done he did not even look at the dog much less change his tones to those of rebuke but the moment don heard his name mentioned he turned and walked away and hid himself under the low branches of a norway spruce near by he was evidently profoundly ashamed of himself was this the result of conscience or of the love of approbation in either case it was very human that the love of approbation is common to many animals we all know dogs and horses certainly can be influenced by praise and blame as easily as men many years ago we had occasion to draw a load of gravel and we put ruby into a tip cart to do the work he was profoundly depressed and evidently felt it as a degradation he hung his head and showed such marks of humiliation that we have never done it since but on the other hand when he goes out under the saddle by the side of a young horse this veteran animal tries as hard to appear young as any old bachelor of sixty years who is still ambitious of social triumphs he dances along and goes sideways and has all the airs and graces of a young colt all this too is very human at one time my dog was fond of going to the railway station to see the people and i always ordered him to go home fearing he should be hurt by the cars he easily understood that if he went there it was contrary to my wishes nevertheless he often went and i do not know but this fondness for forbidden fruit was rather human too so whenever he was near the station if he saw me coming he would look the other way and pretend not to know me if he met me anywhere else he always bounded to meet me with great delight but at the station it was quite different he would pay no attention to my whistle or my call he even pretended to be another dog and would look me right in the face without apparently recognizing me he gave me the cut direct in the most impertinent manner the reason evidently being that he knew he was doing what was wrong and did not like to be found out possibly he may have relied a little on my near-sightedness in this manoeuvre that animals have acute observation memory imagination the sense of approbation strong affections and the power of reasoning is therefore very evident 
lord bacon also speaks of a dog's reverence for his master as partaking of a religious element mark says he what a generosity and courage a dog will put on when he finds himself maintained by a man who to him is instead of a god which courage he could not attain without that confidence in a better nature than his own who that has seen the mute admiration and trust in a dog's eye as he looks up at his master but can see in it something of a religious reverence the germ and first principle of religion what then is the difference between the human soul and that of the animal in its highest development that there is a very marked difference between man and the highest animal is evident the human being weaker in proportion than all other animals has subjected them all to himself he has subdued the earth by his inventions physically too feeble to dig a hole in the ground like a rabbit or to fell a tree like a beaver unable to live in the water like a fish or to move through the air like a bird he yet by his inventive power and his machinery can compel the forces of nature to work for him they are the true genii slaves of his lamp air fire water electricity and magnetism build his cities and his stately ships run his errands carry him from land to land and accept him as their master whence does man obtain this power some say it is the human hand which has made man supreme it is no doubt a wonderful machine a box of tools in itself the size and strength of the thumb and the power of opposing it to the extremities of the fingers distinguishes according to most anatomists the human hand from that of the quadrumanous animals in those monkeys which are nearest to man the thumb is so short and weak and the fingers so long and slender that their tips can scarcely be brought in opposition excellent for climbing they are not good for taking up small objects or supporting large ones but the hand of man could accomplish little without the mind behind it it was therefore a good remark of galen that man is not the wisest of animals because he has a hand but god has given him a hand because he is the wisest of animals the size of the human brain relatively greater than that of almost any other animal man's structure adapting him to stand erect his ability to exist in all climates his power of subsisting on varied food all these facts of his physical nature are associated with his superior mental power but do not produce it the question recurs what enables him to stand at the head of the animal creation perhaps the chief apparent distinctions between man and other animals are these one the lowest races of men use tools other animals do not two the lowest human beings possess a verbal language other animals have none three man has the capacity of self-culture as an individual other animals have not four human beings associated in society are capable of progress in civilization by means of science art literature and religion other animals are not five men have a capacity for religion no animal except man has this the lowest races of men use tools but no other animal does this this is so universally admitted by science that the presence of the rudest tools of stone is considered a sufficient trace of the presence of man if stone hatchets or hammers or arrowheads are found in any stratum though no human bones are detected anthropologists regard this as a sufficient proof of the existence of human beings in the period indicated by such a geologic formation the only tools used by animals in procuring food in war or in building their homes are their natural organs their beaks teeth claws etc it may be added that man alone wears clothes other animals being sufficiently clothed by nature no animals make a fire though they often suffer from cold but there is no race of men unacquainted with the use of fire 
no animals possess a verbal language animals can remember some of the words used by men and associate with them their meaning but this is not the use of language it is merely the memory of two associated facts as when the animal recollects where he found food and goes to the same place to look for it again animals have different cries indicating different wants they use one cry to call their mate another to terrify their prey but this is not the use of verbal language human language implies not merely an acquaintance with the meaning of particular words but the power of putting them together in a sentence animals have no such language as this for if they had it would have been learned by men man has the power of learning any verbal language adelong and vater reckon over three thousand languages spoken by men and any man can learn any of them the negroes speak their own languages in their own countries they speak arabic in north africa they learn to speak english french and spanish in america and oriental languages when they go to the east if any animals had a verbal language with its vocabulary and grammar men would long ago have learned it and would have been able to converse with them again no animal except man is capable of self-culture as an individual animals are trained by external influences they do not teach themselves an old wolf is much more cunning than a young one but he has been made so by the force of circumstances you can teach your dog tricks but no dog has ever taught himself any yet the lowest savages teach themselves to make tools to ornament their paddles and clubs and acquire certain arts by diligent effort birds will sometimes practise the tunes which they hear played till they have learned them they will also sometimes imitate each other's songs that is they possess the power of vocal imitation but to imitate the sounds we hear is not self-culture it is not developing a new power but it is exercising in a new way a natural gift yet we must admit that in this habit of birds there is the rudiment at least of self-education all races of men are capable of progress in civilization many indeed remain in a savage state for thousands of years and we cannot positively prove that any particular race which has always been uncivilized is capable of civilization but we are led to believe it from having known of so many tribes of men who have emerged from apathy ignorance and barbarism into the light of science and art so it was with all the teutonic races the goths germans celts lombards scandinavians so it was with the arabs who roamed for thousands of years over the deserts a race of ignorant robbers and then filled with the great inspiration of islam flamed up into a brilliant coruscation of science literature art military success and profound learning what great civilizations have grown up in china india persia assyria babylon phoenicia egypt greece rome carthage etruria but no such progress has ever appeared among the animals as their parents were five thousand years ago so essentially are they now nor are animals religious in the sense of worshipping unseen powers higher than themselves my horse showed a sense of the supernatural but this is not worship these are some of the most marked points of difference between man and all other animals now these can all be accounted for by the hypothesis in which locke and leibniz both agreed namely that while animals are capable of reasoning about facts they are incapable of abstract ideas or we may say with coleridge that while animals in common with man possess the faculty of understanding they do not possess that of reason coleridge seems to have intended by this exactly what locke and leibniz meant by their statement when my dog don heard the word apple he thought of the particular concrete apple under the tree and not of apples in general and their relation to pears peaches etc don understood me when i told him to go and get an apple and obeyed 
but he would not have understood me if i had remarked to him that apples were better than pears more wholesome than peaches not so handsome as grapes i should then have gone into the region of abstract and general ideas now it is precisely the possession of this power of abstract thought which will explain the superiority of man to all other animals it explains the use of tools for a tool is an instrument prepared not for one special purpose but to be used generally in certain ways a baboon like a man might pick up a particular stone with which to crack a particular nut but the ape does not make and keep a stone hammer to be used on many similar occasions a box of tools contains a collection of saws planes draw knives etc not made to use on one occasion merely but made for sawing cutting and planing purposes generally still more evident is it that the power of abstraction is necessary for verbal language we do not here use the common term articulate speech for we can conceive of animals articulating their vocal sounds but a word is an abstraction the notion is lifted out of the concrete particular fact and deposited in the abstract general term all words except proper names are abstract and to possess and use a verbal language is impossible without the possession of this mental faculty in regard to self-culture it is clear that for any steady progress one must keep before his mind an abstract idea of what he wishes to do this enables him to rise above impulse passion instinct habit circumstance by the steady contemplation of the proposed aim one can arrange circumstances restrain impulse direct one's activity and become really free in like manner races become developed in civilization by the impact of abstract ideas sometimes it is by coming in contact with other civilized nations which gives them an ideal superior to anything before known sometimes the motive power of their progress is the reception of truths of science art literature or religion it is not necessary to show that without abstract universal and necessary ideas no religion is possible for religion being the worship of unseen powers conceived as existing as active as spiritual necessarily implies these ideas in the mind of the worshipper we find then in the soul of animals all active affectionate and intelligent capacities as in that of man the only difference is that man is capable of abstract ideas which give him a larger liberty of action which enable him to adopt an aim and pursue it and which change his affections from an instinctive attachment into a principle of generous love add then to the animal soul the capacity for abstract ideas and it would rise at once to the level of man meantime in a large part of their nature they have the same faculties with ourselves they share our emotions and we theirs they are made a little lower than man and if we are souls so surely are they are they immortal to discuss this question would require more space than we can here give to it for my own part i fully believe in the continued existence of all souls at the same time assuming their continued advance the law of life is progress and one of the best features in the somewhat unspiritual theory of darwin is its profound faith in perpetual improvement this theory is the most startling optimism that has ever been taught for it makes perpetual progress to be the law of the whole universe many of the arguments for the immortality of man cannot indeed be used for our dumb relations the animals we cannot argue from their universal faith in a future life nor contend that they need an immortality on moral grounds to recompense their good conduct and punish their wickedness we might indeed adduce a reason implied in our saviour's parable and believe that the poor creatures who have received their evil things in this life will be comforted in another 
moreover we might find in many animals qualities fitting them for a higher state there are animals as we have seen who show a fidelity courage generosity often superior to what we see in man the dogs who have loved their master more than food and starved to death on his grave are surely well fitted for a higher existence jesse tells a story of a cat which was being stoned by cruel boys men went by and did not interfere but a dog that saw it did he drove away the boys and then took the cat to his kennel licked her all over with his tongue and his conduct interested people who brought her milk the canine nurse took care of her till she was well and the cat and dog remained fast friends ever after such an action in a man would have been called heroic and we think such a dog would not be out of place in heaven yet it is not so much on particular cases of animal superiority that we rely but on the difficulty of conceiving in any sense of the destruction of life the principle of life whether we call it soul or body matter or spirit escapes all observation of the senses all that we know of it by observation is that beside the particles of matter which compose an organized body there is something else not cognizable by the senses which attracts and dismisses them modifies and coordinates them the unity of the body is not to be found in its sensible phenomena but in something which escapes the senses into the vortex of that life material molecules are being continually absorbed and from it they are perpetually discharged if death means the dissolution of the body we die many times in the course of our earthly career for every body is said by human anatomists to be changed in all its particles once in seven years what then remains if all the particles go the principle of organization remains and this invisible persistent principle constitutes the identity of every organized body if i say that i have the same body when i am fifty which i had at twenty it is because i mean by body that which continues unaltered amid the fast flying particles of matter this life principle makes and remakes the material frame that body does not make it when what we call death intervenes all that we can assert is that the life principle has done wholly and at once what it has always been doing gradually and in part what happens to the material particles we see they become detached from the organizing principle and relapse into simply mechanical and chemical conditions what has happened to that organizing principle we neither see nor know and we have absolutely no reason at all for saying that it has ceased to exist this is as true of plants and of animals as of men and there is no reason for supposing that when these die their principle of life is ended it probably has reached a crisis which consists in the putting on of new forms and ascending into a higher order of organized existence end of essay one essay two of three essays by james freeman clark this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by david wales essay two affinities of buddhism and christianity it has long been known that many analogies exist between buddhism and christianity the ceremonies ritual and rites of the buddhists strikingly resemble those of the roman catholic church the buddhist priests are monks they take the same three vows of poverty chastity and obedience which are binding on those of the roman church they are mendicants like the mendicant orders of st francis and st dominic they are tonsured use strings of beads like the rosary with which to count their prayers have incense and candles in their worship use fasts processions litanies and holy water they have something akin to the adoration of saints 
repeat prayers in an unknown tongue have a chanted psalmody with a double choir and suspend the censer from five chains in china some buddhists worship the image of a virgin called the queen of heaven having an infant in her arms and holding a cross in tibet the grand lamas wear a mitre dalmatica and cope and pronounce a benediction on the laity by extending the right hand over their heads the dalai lama resembles the pope and is regarded as the head of the church the worship of relics is very ancient among the buddhists and so are pilgrimages to sacred places besides these resemblances in outward ceremonies more important ones appear in the inner life and history of the two religions both belong to those systems which derive their character from a human founder and not from a national tendency to the class which contains the religions of moses zoroaster confucius and mohammed and not to that in which the brahmanical egyptian scandinavian greek and roman religions are found both buddhism and christianity are catholic and not ethnic that is not confined to a single race or nation but by their missionary spirit passing beyond these boundaries and making converts among many races christianity began among the jews as a semitic religion but being rejected by the jewish nation established itself among the aryan races of europe in the same way buddhism beginning among an aryan people the hindus was expelled from hindustan and established itself among the mongol races of eastern asia besides its resemblances to the roman catholic side of christendom buddhism has still closer analogies with the protestant church like protestantism it is a reform which rejects a hierarchical system and does away with the priestly caste like protestantism it has emphasized the purely humane side of life and is a religion of humanity rather than of piety both the christian and buddhist churches teach a divine incarnation and both worship a god-man are these remarkable analogies only casual resemblances or are they real affinities by affinity we here mean genetic relationship are buddhism and christianity related as mother and child one being derived from the other or are they related by both being derived from some common ancestor is either derived from the other as christianity from judaism or protestantism from the papal church that there can be no such affinity as this seems evident from history history shows no trace of the contact which would be required for such influence if christianity had taken its customs from buddhism or buddhism from christianity there must have been ample historic evidence of the fact but instead of this history shows that each has grown up by its own natural development and has unfolded its quality separately and alone the law of evolution also teaches that such great systems do not come from imitation but as growths from a primal germ nor does history give the least evidence of a common ancestry from which both took their common traits we know that buddhism was derived from brahmanism and that christianity was derived from judaism now judaism and brahmanism have few analogies they could not therefore have transmitted to their offspring what they did not themselves possess brahmanism came from an aryan stock in central asia judaism from a semitic stem thousands of miles to the west if buddhism and christianity came from a common source that source must have antedated both the mosaic and brahmanical systems even then it would be a case of atavism in which the original type disappeared in the children to reappear in the later descendants are then these striking resemblances and others which are still to be mentioned only accidental analogies this does not necessarily follow for there is a third alternative they may be what are called in science homologies that is the same law working out similar results under the same conditions though under different circumstances 
the whale lives under different circumstances from other mammalia but being a mammal he has a like osseous structure what seems to be a fin being dissected turns out to be an arm with hand and fingers there are like homologies in history take the instance of the english and french revolutions in each case the legitimate king was tried condemned and executed a republic followed the republic gave way before a strong-handed usurper then the original race of kings was restored but having learned nothing and forgotten nothing they were displaced a second time and a constitutional monarch placed on the throne who though not the legitimate king still belonged to the same race here the same laws of human nature have worked out similar results for no one would suggest that france had copied its revolutions from england and in religion human nature reproduces similar customs and ceremonies under like conditions when for instance you have a mechanical system of prayer in which the number of prayers is of chief importance there must be some way of counting them and so the rosary has been invented independently in different religions we have no room to point out how this law has worked in other instances but it is enough to refer to the principle besides these resemblances between buddhism and christianity there are also some equally remarkable differences which should be noticed the first of these is the striking fact that buddhism has been unable to recognize the existence of the infinite being it has been called atheism by the majority of the best authorities even arthur lilly who defends this system from the charge of agnosticism says an agnostic school of buddhism without doubt exists it professes plain atheism and holds that every mortal when he escapes from rebirths and the causation of karma by the awakenment of the bodhi or gnosis will be annihilated this buddhism by eugene burnouf saint hilaire max muller scoma de Corus, and i believe almost every writer of note is pronounced the original buddhism the buddhism of the south almost every writer of note therefore who has studied buddhism in the pali senegalese chinese and other languages and has had direct access to its original sources has pronounced it a system of atheism but this opinion is opposed to the fact that buddhists have everywhere worshipped unseen and superhuman powers erected magnificent temples maintained an elaborate ritual and adored buddha as the supreme ruler of the worlds how shall we explain this paradox all depends on the definition we give to the word atheism if a system is atheistic which sees only the temporal and not the eternal which knows no god as the author creator and ruler of nature which ascribes the origin of the universe to natural causes to which only the finite is knowable and the infinite unknowable then buddhism is atheism but in that case much of the polytheism of the world must be regarded as atheism for polytheism has largely worshipped finite gods the whole race of olympian deities were finite beings above them ruled the everlasting necessity of things but who calls the greek worshippers atheists the buddha to most buddhists is a finite being one who has passed through numerous births has reached nirvana and will one day be superseded by another buddha yet for the time he is the supreme being ruler of all the worlds he is the object of worship and really divine if in a subordinate sense i would not therefore call this religion atheism no religion which worships superhuman powers can justly be called atheistic on account of its meagre metaphysics how many christians there are who do not fully realize the infinite and eternal nature of the deity to many he is no more than the buddha is to his worshippers a supreme being a mighty ruler governing all things by his will 
how few see god everywhere in nature as jesus saw him letting his sun shine on the evil and good and sending his rain on the just and unjust how few see him in all of life so that not a sparrow dies or a single hair of the head falls without the father most christians recognize the deity only as occasionally interfering by special providences particular judgments and the like but in christianity this ignorance of the eternal nature of god is the exception while in buddhism it is the rule in the reaction against brahmanism the brahmanic faith in the infinite was lost in the fully developed system of the ancient hindu religion the infinite overpowered the finite the temporal world was regarded as an illusion and only the eternal was real the reaction from this extreme was so complete as to carry the buddhists to the exact opposite if to the brahman all the finite visible world was only maya illusion to the buddhists all the infinite unseen world was unknowable and practically nothing perhaps the most original feature of christianity is the fact that it has combined in a living synthesis that which in other systems was divided jesus regarded love to god and love to man as identical positing a harmonious whole of time and eternity piety and humanity faith and works and thus laid the foundation of a larger system than either brahmanism or buddhism he did not invent piety nor discover humanity long before he came the brahmanic literature had sounded the deepest depths of spiritual life and the buddhist missionaries had preached universal benevolence to mankind but the angelic hymn which foretold the new religion as bringing at once glory to god in the highest and on earth peace good will to men indicated the essence of the faith which was at the same time a heavenly love and an earthly blessing this difference of result in the two systems came probably from the different methods of their authors with jesus life was the source of knowledge the life was the light of men with the buddha reflection meditation thought was the source of knowledge in this however he included intuition no less than reflection sakyamuni understood perfectly that a mere intellectual judgment possessed little motive power therefore he was not satisfied till he had obtained an intuitive perception of truth that alone gave at once rest and power but as the pure intellect even in its highest act is unable to grasp the infinite the buddha was an agnostic on this side of his creed by the very success of his method who by searching can find out god the infinite can only be known by the process of living experience this was the method of jesus and has been that of his religion for what is faith but that receptive state of mind which awaits on the lord to receive the illumination which it cannot create by its own processes however this may be it is probable that the fatal defect in buddhism which has neutralized its generous philanthropy and its noble humanities has been the absence of the inspiration which comes from the belief in an eternal world man is too great to be satisfied with time alone or eternity alone he needs to live from and for both hence buddhism is an arrested religion while christianity is progressive christianity has shown the capacity of outgrowing its own defects and correcting its own mistakes for example it has largely outgrown its habit of persecuting infidels and heretics no one is now put to death for heresy it has also passed out of the stage in which religion is considered to consist in leaving the world and entering a monastery the anchorites of the early centuries are no longer to be found in christendom even in catholic countries the purpose of monastic life is no longer to save the soul by ascetic tortures but to attain some practical end the protestant reformation which broke the yoke of priestly power and set free the mind of europe 
was a movement originating in christianity itself like other developments of a similar kind no such signs of progress exist in the system of buddhism it has lost the missionary ardor of its early years it has ceased from creating a vast literature such as grew up in its younger days it no longer produces any wonders of architecture it even lags behind the active life of the countries where it has its greatest power it is a curious analogy between the two systems that while neither the christ nor the buddha practised or taught asceticism their followers soon made the essence of religion to consist in some form of monastic life both jesus and sakyamuni went about doing good both sent their followers into the world to preach a gospel jesus after thirty years of a retired life came among men eating and drinking and associating with publicans and sinners sakyamuni after spending some years as an anchorite deliberately renounced that mode of religion as unsatisfactory and associated with all men as jesus afterwards did within a few centuries after their death their followers relapsed into ascetic and monastic practices but with this difference that while in christendom there has always been both a regular and a secular clergy in the buddhist countries the whole priesthood live in monasteries they have no parish priests unless as an exception while in christian countries the clergy has become more and more a practical body in sympathy with the common life in buddhist lands they live apart and exercise little influence on the civil condition of the people nor must we pass by the important fact that the word christendom is synonymous with a progressive civilization while buddhism is everywhere connected with one which is arrested and stationary the boundaries of the christian religion are exactly coextensive with the advance of science art literature and with the continued accumulation of knowledge power wealth and the comforts of human life according to cunin one of the most recent students of these questions this difference is due to the principle of hope which exists in christianity but is absent in buddhism the one has always believed in a kingdom of god here and a blessed immortality hereafter buddhism has not this hope and this says cunin is a blank which nothing can fill so large a thinker as albert reville has expressed his belief that even the intolerance of christianity indicated a passionate love of truth which has created modern science he says that if europe had not passed through those stages of intolerance it is doubtful whether the science of our day would ever have arrived it is only within the boundaries of nations professing the christian faith that we must go to-day to learn the latest discoveries in science the best works of art the most flourishing literature only within the same circle of christian states is there a government by law and not by will only within these boundaries have the rights of the individual been secured while the power of the state has been increased government by law joined with personal freedom is only to be found where the faith exists which teaches that god not only supports the universal order of natural things but is also the friend of the individual soul and in just that circle of states in which the doctrine is taught that there is no individual soul for god to love and no divine presence in the order of nature human life has subsided into apathy progress has ceased and it has been found impossible to construct national unity saint hilaire affirms that in politics and legislation the dogma of buddhism has remained inferior even to that of brahmanism and has been able to do nothing to constitute states or to govern them by equitable rules these buddhist nations are really six siam burma nepal tibet tartary and ceylon the activity and social progress in china and japan are no exception to this rule for in neither country has buddhism any appreciable influence on the character of the people 
to those who deny that the theology of a people influences its character it may be instructive to see how exactly the good and evil influences of buddhism correspond to the positive and negative traits of its doctrine its merits says saint hilaire are its practical character its abnegation of vulgar gratifications its benevolence mildness sentiment of human equality austerity of manners dislike of falsehood and respect for the family its defects are want of social power egotistical aims ignorance of the ideal good of the sense of human right and human freedom scepticism incurable despair contempt of life all its human qualities correspond to its doctrinal teaching from the beginning it has always taught benevolence patience self-denial charity and toleration its defects arise inevitably from its negative aim to get rid of sorrow and evil by sinking into apathy instead of seeking for the triumph of good and the coming of a reign of god here on the earth as regards the buddha himself modern students differ widely some of course deny his very existence and reduce him to a solar myth m emile senar as quoted by oldenburg following the lalita vistara as his authority makes of him a solar hero born of the morning cloud contending by the power of light with the demons of darkness rising in triumph to the zenith of heavenly glory then passing into the night of nirvana and disappearing from the scene the difficulty about this solar myth theory is that it proves too much it is too powerful a solvent it would dissolve all history how easy it would be in a few centuries to turn general washington and the american revolution into a solar myth great britain a region of clouds and rain represents the kingdom of darkness america with more sunshine is the day great britain as darkness wishes to devour the young day or dawn of light which america is about to diffuse over the earth but washington the solar hero arrives he is from virginia that is born of a virgin he was born in february in the sign of aquarius and the fishes plainly referring to the birth of the sun from the ocean as the sun surveys the earth so washington was said to be a surveyor of many regions the story of the fruitless attempts of the indians to shoot him at braddock's defeat is evidently legendary and in fact this battle itself must be a myth for how can we suppose two english and french armies to have crossed the atlantic and then gone into a wilderness west of the mountains to fight a battle so easy is it to turn history into a solar myth the character of sakyamuni must be learned from his religion and from authentic tradition in many respects his character and influence resembled that of jesus he opposed priestly assumptions taught the equality and brotherhood of man sent out disciples to teach his doctrine was a reformer who relied on the power of truth and love many of his reported sayings resemble those of jesus he was opposed by the brahmins as jesus by the pharisees he compared the brahmins who followed their traditions to a chain of blind men who move on not seeing where they go like jesus he taught that mercy was better than sacrifices like jesus he taught orally and left no writing jesus did not teach in hebrew but in the aramaic which was the popular dialect and so buddha did not speak to the people in sanskrit but in their own tongue which was pali like jesus he seems to have instructed his hearers by parables or stories he was one of the greatest reformers the world has ever seen and his influence after that of the christ has probably exceeded that of any one who ever lived but besides such real resemblances between these two masters we are told of others still more striking which would certainly be hard to explain unless one of the systems had borrowed from the other 
these are said to be the pre-existence of buddha in heaven his birth of a virgin salutation by angels presentation in the temple baptism by fire and water dispute with the doctors temptation in the wilderness transfiguration descent into hell ascension into heaven if these legends could be traced back to the time before christ then it might be argued that the gospels have borrowed from buddhism such however is not the fact these stories are taken from the lalita vistara which according to rhys davies was probably composed between six hundred and a thousand years after the time of buddha by some buddhist poet in nepal rhys davies one of our best authorities says of this poem as evidence of what early buddhism actually was it is of about the same value as some medieval poem would be of the real facts of the gospel history m ernest de bunsen in his work on the angel messiah has given a very exhaustive statement says mr davids of all the possible channels through which christians can be supposed to have borrowed from the buddhists but mr david's conclusion is that he finds no evidence of any such communications of ideas from the east to the west the difference between the wild stories of the lalita vistara and the sober narratives of the gospels is quite apparent another writer professor seidel thinks after a full and careful examination that only five facts in the gospels may have been borrowed from buddhism these are one the fast of jesus before his work two the question in regard to the blind man who did sin this man or his parents three the pre-existence of christ four the presentation in the temple five nathaniel sitting under a fig tree compared with buddha under a bow tree but Kinnan has examined these parallels and considers them merely accidental coincidences and in truth it is very hard to conceive of one religion borrowing its facts or legends from another if that other stands in no historic relation to it that buddhism should have taken much from brahmanism is natural for brahmanism was its mother that christianity should have borrowed many of its methods from judaism is equally natural for judaism was its cradle modern travellers in burma and tartary have found that the buddhists hold a kind of camp-meeting in the open air where they pray and sing suppose that some critic noticing this should assert that when wesley and his followers established similar customs they must have borrowed them from the buddhists the absurdity would be evident new religions grow they are not imitations it has been thought however that christianity was derived from the essenes because of certain resemblances and it is argued that the essenes must have obtained their monastic habits from the therapeutae in egypt and that the therapeutae received them from the buddhists because they could not have found them elsewhere this theory however has been dismissed from the scene by the young german scholar who has proved that the essay in the therapeutae ascribed to philo was really written by a christian anchorite in the third or fourth century the result then of our investigation is this there is no probability that the analogies between christianity and buddhism have been derived the one from the other they have come from the common and universal needs and nature of man which repeat themselves again and again in like positions and like circumstances that jesus and buddha should both have retired into the wilderness before undertaking their great work is probable for it has been the habit of other reformers to let a period of meditation precede their coming before the world that both should have been tempted to renounce their enterprise is also in accordance with human nature that in after times the simple narratives should be overlaid with additions and a whole mass of supernatural wonders added as we find in the apocryphal gospels and the lalita vistara is also in accordance with the working of the human mind laying aside all such unsatisfactory resemblances we must regard the buddha as having been one of the noblest of men and one whom jesus would have readily welcomed as a fellow-worker and a friend 
he opposed a dominant priesthood maintained the equal religious rights of all mankind overthrew caste encouraged woman to take her place as man's equal forbade all bloody sacrifices and preached a religion of peace and good will seeking to triumph only in the fair conflict of reason with reason if he was defective in the loftiest instincts of the soul if he knew nothing of the infinite and eternal if he saw nothing permanent in the soul of man if his highest purpose was negative to escape from pain sorrow anxiety toil let us still be grateful for the influence which has done so much to tame the savage mongols and to introduce hospitality and humanity into the homes of lhasa and siam if edwin arnold a poet idealizes him too highly it is the better fault and should be easily forgiven hero worshippers are becoming scarce in our time let us make the most of those we have End of Essay 2《Essay 3 of Three Essays by James Freeman Clark. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Wales. Essay 3 Why I Am Not a Free Religionist. What is meant by free religion? I understand by it individualism in religion. It is the religious belief which has made itself independent of historic and traditional influences so far as it is in the power of any one to attain such independence in christian lands it means a religion which has cut loose from the bible and the christian church and which is as ready to question the teaching of jesus as that of socrates or buddha it is what emerson called himself an endless seeker with no past behind it it is entire trust in the private reason as the sole authority in matters of religion free religion may be regarded as protestantism carried to its ultimate results a protestant christian accepts the leadership of jesus and keeps himself in the christian communion but he uses his own private judgment to discover what jesus taught and what christianity really is the free religionist goes a step farther and decides by his own private judgment what is true and what false no matter whether taught by jesus or not free religion as thus understood seems to me opposed to the law of evolution and incompatible with it evolution educes the present from the past by a continuous process free religion cuts itself loose from the past and makes every man the founder of his own religion according to the law of evolution confirmed by history every advance in religion is the development from something going before jewish monotheism grew out of polytheism christianity and mohammedism out of judaism buddhism out of brahmanism protestant christianity out of the roman catholic church jesus himself said think not that i am come to destroy the law or the prophets i am not come to destroy but to fulfil the higher religions are not made they grow of each it may be said as of the poet nascitur non fit therefore if there is to arrive something higher than our existing christianity it must not be a system which forsakes the christian belief but something developed from it according to the principle of evolution every growing and productive religion obeys the laws of heredity and of variation it has an inherited common life and a tendency to modification by individual activity omit or depress either factor and the religion loses its power of growth without a common life the principle of development is arrested he who leaves the great current which comes from the past loses headway this current in the christian communion is the inherited spirit of jesus it is his life continued in his church his central conviction of love to god and to man of fatherhood and brotherhood of the power of truth to conquer error of good to overcome evil of a kingdom of heaven to come to us here it is the faith of jesus in things unseen 
his hope of the triumph of right over wrong his love going down to the lowliest child of god these vital convictions in the soul of jesus are communicated by contact from generation to generation they are propagated as he suggested like leaven hidden in the dough by a different figure plato in his dialogue of ion shows that inspiration is transmitted like the magnetic influence which causes iron rings to adhere and hang together in a chain thoughts and opinions are communicated by argument reasoning speech and writing but faith and inspiration by the influence of life on life the life of jesus is thus continued in his church and those who stand outside of it lose much of this transmitted and sympathetic influence common life in a religious body furnishes the motive force which carries it forward while individual freedom gives the power of improvement the two principles of heredity and variation must be united in order to combine union and freedom and to secure progress where freedom of thought ceases religion becomes rigid it is incapable of development such for instance is the condition of buddhism which at first full of intellectual activity has now hardened into a monkish ritual free religion sacrifices the motive power derived from association and religious sympathy for the sake of a larger intellectual freedom the result is individualism it founds no churches but spends much force in criticizing the christian community its belief and its methods these are no doubt open to criticism which would do good if administered sympathetically and from within but produce little result when delivered in the spirit of antagonism imperfect as the christian church is it ought to be remembered that in it are to be found the chief strength and help of the charities philanthropies and moral reforms of our time every one who has at heart a movement for the benefit of humanity appeals instinctively for aid to the christian churches it is in these that such movements usually originate and are carried on even when as in the anti-slavery movement a part of the churches refuse to sympathize with a new moral or social movement the reproaches made against them show that in the mind of the community an interest in all humane endeavor is considered to be a part of their work the common life and convictions of these bodies enable them to accomplish what individualism does not venture to undertake individualism is incapable of organized and sustained work of this sort though it can and often does cooperate earnestly with it the teaching of jesus is founded on the synthesis of truth and love jesus declares himself to have been born to bear witness to the truth and he also makes love divine and human the substance of his gospel the love element produces union the truth element freedom union without freedom stiffens into a rigid conservatism freedom without union breaks up into an intellectual atomism the christian churches have gone into both extremes but never permanently for christianity as long as it adheres to its founder and his ideas has the power of self-recovery its diseases are self-limited it has had many such periods but has recovered from them it passed through an age in which it ran to ascetic self-denial and made saints of self-torturing anchorites it afterward became a speculative system and tended to metaphysical creeds and doctrinal distinctions it became a persecuting church burning heretics and jews and torturing infidels as an act of faith it was tormented by dark superstitions believing in witchcraft and magic but it has left all these evils behind no one is now put to death for heresy or witchcraft the monastic orders in the church are preachers and teachers or given to charity no one could be burned to-day as a heretic no one to-day believes in witchcraft the old creeds which once held the church in irons are now slowly disintegrating but reform as i have said must come from within by the gradual elimination of those inherited beliefs which interfere with the unity of the church 
and the leadership of christ himself the platonic and egyptian trinity remaining as dogma repeated but not understood the manichaean division of the human race into children of god and children of the devil the scholastic doctrine of the atonement by which the blood of jesus expiates human guilt are being gradually explained in accordance with reason and the teaching of jesus some beliefs once thought to be of vital importance are now seen by many to be unessential or are looked at in a different light instead of making jesus an exceptional person we are coming to regard him as a representative man the realized ideal of what man was meant to be and will one day become instead of considering his sinlessness as setting him apart from his race we look on it as showing that sin is not the natural but unnatural condition of mankind his miracles are regarded not as violations of the laws of nature but anticipation of laws which one day will be universally known and which are boundless as the universe nor will they in future be regarded as evidence of the mission of jesus since he himself was grieved when they were so looked upon and he made his truth and his character the true evidence that he came from god the old distinction between natural and supernatural will disappear when it is seen that jesus had a supernatural work and character the same in kind as ours though higher in degree the supreme gifts which make him the providential leader of the race do not set him apart from his brethren if we see that it is a law of humanity that gifts differ and that men endowed with superior powers become leaders in science art literature politics as jesus has become the chief great spiritual leader of mankind men are now searching the scriptures not under the bondage of an infallible letter but seeking for the central ideas of jesus and the spirit of his gospel they begin to accept the maxim of goethe no matter how much the gospels contradict each other provided the gospel does not contradict itself the profound convictions of christ which pervade all his teaching give the clue by which to explain the divergence in the narrative we interpret the letter by the light of the spirit we see how jesus emphasized the law of human happiness that it comes from within not from without that the pure in heart see god and that it is more blessed to give than to receive we comprehend the stress he lays on the laws of progress that he who humbleth himself shall be exalted we recognize his profound conviction that all god's children are dear to him that his son rises on the evil and the good and that he will seek the one lost sheep till he find it we see his trust in the coming of the kingdom of god in this world the triumph of good over evil and the approaching time when the knowledge of god shall fill the earth as the waters cover the sea and we find his profound faith in the immortal life which abides in us so that whoever shares that faith with him can never die the more firmly these central ideas of jesus are understood and held the less importance belongs to any criticism of the letter this or that saying attributed to jesus in the record may be subjected to attack but it is the main current of his teaching which has made him the leader of civilized man for eighteen centuries that majestic stream will sweep on undisturbed though there may be eddies here or stagnant pools there which induce hasty observers to suppose that it has ceased to flow rusticus expectat dum defluit omnis et illi volviter et volveter in omne volubilis avium i sometimes read attacks on special sayings of the record which argue to the critic's mind that jesus was in error here or mistaken there but i would recommend to such writers to ponder the suggestive rule of coleridge until i can understand the ignorance of plato i shall consider myself ignorant of his understanding or the remark of emerson to the youth who brought him a paper in which he thought he had refuted plato if you attack the king be sure that you kill him 
when the christian world really takes jesus himself as its leader instead of building its faith on opinions about him we may anticipate the arrival of that union which he foresaw and foretold as thou father art in me and i in thee that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me then christians ceasing from party strife and sectarian dissension will unite in one mighty effort to cure the evils of humanity and redress its wrongs before a united christendom what miseries could remain unrelieved war that criminal absurdity that monstrous anachronism must at last be abolished pauperism vice and crime though continuing in sporadic forms would cease to exist as a part of the permanent institutions of civilization a truly catholic church united under the master would lead all humanity up to a higher plane the immense forces developed by modern science and the magnificent discoveries in the realm of nature helpless now to cure the wrongs of suffering man would become instruments of potent use under the guidance of moral forces according to the law of evolution this is what we have a right to expect if we follow the lines of historic development not being led into extreme individualism if we maintain the continuity of human progress this vast result must finally arrive for such reasons i prefer to remain in the communion of the christian body doing what i may to assist its upward movement for such reasons i am not a free religionist end of essay three end of three essays by james freeman clark